Uh, so everyone that's staying, I'd love you to stay. Uh, try to make this as informative, but as conversational as we can in the time allotted, about 15 minutes. But we'll also be here at my booth, uh, 334, I believe is the number. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today briefly is how smart communities, smart environments are powered by big data, but I want to do it with a spin on use cases and stories versus right into the weeds of the technology. I think that would be a little nice this time of the afternoon. But a little background of who I am. So my name is Jeremy Parsons. I work with an organization called SoftServe. We are a global strategy and consulting firm. We work with many municipalities as well as P3, public-private partnerships, helping to build what we call smart environments with a focus on enabling the community, fostering relationships between the people and the services that, that they deserve and demand and providing it in ways through technology that reduces cost, optimizes services, operations, efficiency, and also makes it readily available for all aspects of the community. So a little bit about background, right? What is a smart community? So little numbers, 68% of the world population is going to live in urban environments. We're in Atlanta today, and if you've seen the traffic today, you can feel that like 95% of the world lives in Atlanta, at least this morning it felt like it when I was driving in. But as we start moving back into these environments, what we need to think about is how do you manage that population and serve them the right way? Well, traditionally, it would be you go around and you talk to them, ask them what they want. But today, it's more about data, right? It's more about collecting and being proactive on enabling outreach or enabling services that they might want. So what we've done is we've partnered with different organizations and different communities to build what I call a framework, right? Which is this intelligent municipality. It focuses on five uh, key tenets. First is emergency medical services, because it's always about when in need and when in problem situations. Unfortunately, this time of year, we can think about certain events. You want to be able to access the services to provide help and rescue or what have you when that citizen needs it. Public safety goes around the idea of how do we make sure that our communities are safe and embracing for the community to foster conversation, what have you. Commerce, services, and outreach. As you see, we can go around it. It's all about building this, this experience, right? It's all about a community citizen experience. So part of what we've looked at is, you know, one thing about value of safety. Data is driving better situations in our communities or making it safer to live there, right? So if you think about road traffic and fire safety, one of the things that we're working with, and I have some slides on this week's show, is we're working with intelligent uh, traffic management systems. We're working with intelligent routing systems where we can use the data to understand you know, what is the current situation to route, for example, police and fire safety to a house that's on fire and help them reroute around potential accidents or bottlenecks or situations that might cause delay to respond. On the other side, you, know, you think about homicide, we're working with organizations where we're putting intelligent cameras into locations where they can ma uh, monitor massive areas of land and look for people that are might possibly going to do deviant behaviors, right? So we can actually identify, track, and trace those individuals and then alert citizen uh, protection services, whether it's public safety, police, or what have you, of that individual, as well as where they're located in real time. So we're thinking about all these things of public safety and reduction of crime, but we're also thinking about commerce, right? The reason you move to an urban environment is you want to be able to go from your flat or your apartment down to the grocery store, down to the local stores or boutiques, and have that kind of life experience where everything's convenient, everything's easy to get to, and it's everything that you want or desire in a reasonable location in terms of geography. So we're also looking at saving money in terms of that commerce direction through, you know, maybe it's wayfinding, maybe it's relationships between public-private you know, organizations, such as, let's say, the Atlanta Falcons. How do you improve the experience of going to a football game, maintaining or improving the amount of revenue that the city can drive from that, but also improve the experience so people want to come back, right? So all of this is you know, driving you know, at the end of the day, safety, commerce, what have you. So I'm going to jump into a little faster because we've got 10 minutes here, and I think pictures say a lot. Interaction, right? How many of you have an iPhone? This is always a great question. Yeah, a whole audience, I'm assuming, hopefully. I know you raised your hand, thanks. You know, for example, this week, uh, they announced the iPhone 11, right? And people might have a Samsung as well. You use that phone. It is tied to your hip. This is how you interact with everyone from your family, your friends, 
your loved ones, and in reality, we would like to interact with our government and our service providers, not just those people like Amazon that we buy things from, but also the people that might clean my streets, might help me find the way to the Atlanta Falcons game where I can go there quickly and effectively without breaking my neck on the staircases out here, because by the way, that is quite a challenge at night, right? So as a citizen and as a service provider, this interlock is that mobile phone. We're working with organizations and building out this concept of the phone is providing events and receiving events. We can drive customer behavior or citizen engagement by helping to pass them through, in this case, you know, what will I see in Atlanta? What's happening today? What do I want to see? Where do I want to go? Right? You might think of that, well, that just sounds like you're trying to sell me on how to go to a football game. If you think about that one aspect, fine, but the other side of it is as we're engaging with the, with the citizens, through their mobile phone, we're able to see where the population is in case there is an emergency. So now we have insight into where public safety might need to respond, right? So as you have this interaction, you have people providing feedback and events or data points where you can then report on and, and actually be proactive, right? So getting there, where's parking, what have you. you know, all of this ties together based on the interaction that individual's having with the phone with the services in real time of the city or the community. How it works, right? So we talked about events, right? So cities, communities that we're working with today, they're looking at how do we become closer in touch with our citizens, right? The people either living or visiting within that environment in that given time. So one example here is showing you how we can take any aspect of data, right? Using technology, it makes everything possible. We can take things like text data, comments on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, digital 311 systems. So if you're actually able to either robo chat or text, you know, hey, I need help, please find me this, right? You can have this influx of data coming through as text that we can then track and trace and, and interrogate to create the nuggets of wisdom that we need to drive activity. You also have the ability to link in with things like intelligent uh, traffic systems and video monitoring systems and safety monitoring systems where you can pull it all together to provide this layer of truth or this single visibility of what's going on. Okay. Questions, comments, thoughts? No? Okay. The, other th the other thing that we're looking at is you know, as we start building this relationship, some communities are looking, how do I get deeper involved with my community? How do I better understand who's living there and what services should I provide? Right, it sounds great that I come to where I live in Raleigh and they have what's called the cat bus. Right, and in that case, that service is to means to provide transportation for those that can't afford a car, do not want to afford a car, and get them to places they want to go. But when you're running a transportation system like that, it would be really great to understand what are the type of people that want to use that service, where do they live, and what is the pattern at which they're going to utilize that service. In Raleigh, for example, you know, most people that I know don't use the bus during the day to go to work because the traffic doesn't allow that type of experience. It's just there's too much traffic, the roads aren't designed that way. But on weekends, nobody wants to take their car to the city. So what we're looking at is as you start building a profile of understanding of what your individual citizens want, you can start to think about, well, shoot, maybe I should change that bus to no longer go out to Wake Forest or to the suburbs, except on the weekends, because we can see the behaviors, we can see the patterns of what they want. On the other side of it, if you look at engagement with the citizens, you can understand the type of people they are. You might want to change how you send out information around your community. For example, if people are more um, extroverted, you, know, you might want to use digital signage and you know, public announcement te technology to make alerts and messaging versus doing mailers. Right? Whereas an introvert, they're not going to be outside often. They're not going to be in big group events. They're going to basically receive that as an individual layer. Right? So we have ways to look at how do we take and start building profiles of a citizen, but also how do we protect that citizen's rights? I, we do not want to identify them as Jessica Cormier. We want to identify them as people that live in this zip code or this area code have a propensity to do these activities or to request these types of services. Or worst case scenario, they seem to be the ones making all the false calls to the police department and doing the false roles because, hey, they don't like the noise of this construction group. Well, you can start to see these behaviors and say, you know what, anytime this area, maybe we want to adjust how we serve our service. But it's all about understanding and building profiles of who and what, who and where they live, right? 
The way we do this is we think about the different touch points, once again, that people are interacting. They might interact with your city through Twitter, they might interact through web pages, might interact through email, what have you. We can actually use that information and use processing technologies that will take you know, common language, common written out paragraphs, and actually detect, are they angry? Are they mad? What is the inflection of the wording that they've used? We can also link that to voice recognition. Are they angry or mad? We're also working where if you're staring at a camera like I'm doing somewhere in this room, I can tell you if you're stressed by the way the camera can measure your face and the reactions of your face in real time. So we're actually doing that and coupling it with things like EKG readings where we can really confirm this guy called, he says he needs help but he's not really sure, but according to other metrics, he's in a serious situation. He just doesn't want to advertise it because maybe somebody's you know, stalking him or following him, right? You can, in real time, start to understand a different dynamic. But all of this is what we're using to build profiles of what individuals might be like inside of your org or city or community to then allow you to drive insight, right? And some of the main outcomes you know, that we think about is you know, how can you improve your services, how can you improve your community, but also maybe how you change your community, community in terms of how do they relate themselves to the citizens. Some other things around, you know, how it works. So we look at the big, big picture here. We have many ways to digest data, right? So as your cities or communities are growing, you have what I always call the, the history of success, right? Unfortunately, we've been around for, you know, 10s, 20s, 30s, really hundreds of years in some cases for some cities and communities. And you look at the infrastructure. Let's be honest, we all can't go out and spend $5 billion tomorrow to buy smart lighting, smart cameras, you know, robots, there's some drone out there that's gonna deliver me my lunch in about 10 minutes, you know, all of that stuff. It'd be great to have it all tomorrow, but we're not gonna have it. So what we need is an ability to take all of this disparate data, unify it across a common view, and then distribute it so that we can take actions or we can populate the applications that our community is interacting with us, okay? So what we look at here is we've created this idea of a platform or a framework is really what it is to pull in this data in real time or near real time, depending on the source, create an inventory of the artifacts, of the assets, whether it's a picture of someone reporting, you know, someone parked the wrong way. Maybe it's an accident and someone took a photo of that car wreck. You know, they can actually submit that photo and through intelligence within this system, we can determine, you know, in some cases, who was at fault in that accident just by linking the photo to historical records at the police station to say, okay, if any time the car's hit like this, it's common sense. That car is at fault of that car. But wait, what if there's a light there and it says no turn on yellow or red, and he's turning? We can actually start using things like photos and video to add other dimensions that the police might not have noticed on that initial report or reception, right? In terms of more positive feedback, we can look at what are people taking pictures of in terms of our city, and how do we maybe enhance it through beautification projects. We notice that a lot of people are doing you know, walkabouts through Atlanta and they're taking pictures of this area versus Buckhead versus Midtown. Maybe you wanna start collecting an asset inventory over time of what does the city look like? What do the people, who are there? What are they doing? What are the activities? Or heaven forbid, how many bird scooters, sorry bird, are out in the intersections left out you know, causing a, a ruckus, right? Causing a traffic delay. All this real-time information can be digested, put into an asset inventory, and then leveraged to drive insight and action, okay? Not just imagery, but we can also look at things like Facebook interaction and text interaction or your ITMS uh, intelligent traffic. All these different things could be potential sources of ingestion. On a more granular level, if you're familiar with kind of cloud computing, we're looking at building this as a holistic approach. In this case, we're using Google, but it could be any cloud provider. You take all of these ingestion points, and this makes a little more sense as you start to think about it. You have the Ali bus, you have the smart traffic lights, you have the cameras that can actually detect what you're doing, and then you have your digital 311 systems or interaction systems. As we're pulling that all in, we have these capabilities to make a scalable platform, to my point earlier. You can't buy everything today or tomorrow, right? You have to be able to scale for growth and for changes and be able to adapt. The cloud technology that's out there and some of the services that we've been building actually enable that because it's a loosely coupled architecture, a loosely coupled framework. The big data component is all about how do you process these data as a new different techniques in speed to provide relevancy, right? 
data and big data processing has changed in the last you know, year alone, where we're now able to process information and information types that we weren't able to last year, just because we now have better ways to create taxonomies or semantic recognition, if you will, of wording or of written word versus typed word, or of Cyrillic versus you know, Latin character. We have all these abilities that are continuously evolving. The frameworks that we're looking at deploying are actually scalable and, and changeable. Sorry, my, keep going? Yeah? Okay. Um, and then you know, we're coupling that framework with applications that you're using today. So not only is it about the services that the community is providing, but let's talk about other things, public-private relationships. Maybe we couple things with like ways we can pull data streams in to better service for example, public transit. So we're in some organizations where they're like, hey, I know my optimized route planning, or so I think. Wouldn't it be great if I could couple in dimensions like people are using today, Waze or Google traffic, couple that with weather, couple that with you know, people tweeting and, and texting and whatever else they're doing on our buses these days to understand that even though it says it's optimal, we notice a pattern. Every Wednesday at three o'clock, that bus is having a challenge getting around that corner because this guy has decided to always park his car here to get his coffee, right? I'm using a funny example, but we can start seeing patterns and adjust that in real time in our platform to actually tell the driver of that bus, instead of going right on this second avenue, go one more block and turn right because you'll avoid this congestion and improve the quality of service. So it's all about data driving real time insight that then they can take action, whether it's machine or human centric. Questions, comments? Um, I think with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out. Uh, just open up, anybody have any questions or thoughts? I know this is a fast fire hose. Um, yeah. Sure. And this is actually a good point, right? And you see it in Europe as well as here. You know, there's things like GDPR and you know, personal identification uh, legislation where I can't identify. What's your name? So we don't want to know, Scott, everything you do. We don't want to know, for example, in the US, we're not there yet, but in Germany, they can't take your picture and store your face in any government repository. It's against the law. So what we're looking at is, okay, how, because we can, doesn't mean we should. So we can capture all of the data, and Facebook I always use because everyone's familiar, but there are other dimensions that we can also map where we can obfuscate. Facebook is all about opt-in. You chose to Facebook the city of Atlanta, so therefore you've opted the right for us to use your data. Other, you know, other people may not have, so I can't go and scrape uh, my wife, Rebecca. I can't scrape her page because she did not opt in, right? But you've opted in, so you're interacting. So I can use you as a dimension, and maybe there's another guy like Bob that is similar in profile to you, so now I can start to build that understanding of what the community wants. But the other way we're looking at it is, you know, there are tools out there that will even ensure that I'm not tracking data that I should not have. So we pull in all of, let's say, historical um, tax records and police files and public safety files, a lot of that. You still have to obfuscate who did what where, and you can't necessarily show maybe someone, you got a ticket, unfortunately. I can't expose that in certain ways, so we're looking at how can we use data and machine learning to actually understand what should not be shown and automatically redact that out of the forms and then only use the data that's relevant and allowable to build the dimensions of profiles. Right, so it's all about understanding the data first and capturing it in a meaningful way and then using the technology to protect the citizens and drive the services or events they want. But it's definitely, it's in every conversation I've been in and that's why a lot of people are going into it, well, let's offer them an opt-in. That's how we go, right? Question? Yeah? So, 
so at a high level, right, so my, what I've shown you is a framework. I use the word platform, but it's actually a framework that's digestible and, and break, um, it can be broken up or distributed into different use cases, different parts. So in your scenario, we might use certain components of that to do what's called, you know, like data forensics. So we can pull in all of your historical data and provide now an avenue to do that type of reporting and feedback. But it's not of, out, of the sh out of the box or off the shelf. There's no real package. I don't know if I'm answering where you're going. The net is we can enable it through these techniques and technologies. It might not just be that exact picture. Does that make sense? In a way? Okay. Yeah. Good? Done? Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>